In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. In our reflection upon history and the study of the innumerable events of humanity's past, we are inevitably forced to study the horrors and inhumane transgressions and injustices that have occurred. Apartheid South Africa was an inhumane system that made life for everyday black people absolutely miserable. Apartheid laws discriminated against black people in Southern Africa in every facet of life and made everyday living for black people absolutely miserable. In fact, in the book Kaffir Boy, the true story of a black youth coming of age in apartheid South Africa by Mark Maitabon, he narrates a story of the injustices that occurred under that brutal regime. One day, an impoverished group of black people, so hungry and so desperate for food, in a white neighborhood, they begin searching the trash cans of white people just to be able to have something to eat. And they were utterly shocked by how much food white people wasted in these trash cans. One black woman commented, they eat well than white people. Another elderly black woman responded, they have everything and we have nothing. Under apartheid, black people had nothing and they were taught that they were nothing. Under apartheid, black people in the millions were imprisoned for a crime as simple as being unemployed. That's right, under apartheid, it was a crime. It was illegal for black people to even be unemployed. Unemployment resulted in a prison system that then resulted in forced labor. Under apartheid, the movements of black people were restricted through a brutal past system by which ordinary, everyday black people, in order to work in white areas, had to go and present a past. And any violation of those past laws resulted in a lengthy prison system. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa to the believers, what is the matter with you that you fight not in the cause of Allah and for the oppressed among men, women, and children whose cry is, Our Lord, take us out of this city of oppressive people and appoint for us from yourself a protector and appoint for us from yourself a helper. Today, I am here to discuss the life of an imam who heard the cries of black people as they were suffering under the tyranny of this apartheid regime and who heard the cries of black people to be rescued from an oppressive regime and who responded to those calls. His name was Imam Abdullah Haroon, a Muslim freedom fighter who struggled against the apartheid regime. To discuss the life of Imam Abdullah Haroon as well as lessons that Muslims can learn from studying his life I have with me Brother Khalid. Salam alaikum, brother. Alaikum salam wa Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. So, um, first, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself as well as your relationship with Imam Abdullah Haroon? Yeah, so I, um, I currently I live in Cape Town, South Africa, and uh, I grew up in London. I was born in London in 1975. My mother was is Cape Townian. She left in '68 uh, and went to London to study uh, because she couldn't study what she wanted to uh, over here because mm. she was considered um, what they call Malay, Cape Malay, or coloured. Mm. You know, and they were they were designated because of the colour, as we know. So she left uh, to study to pursue her studies. And my dad left Libya. Um, after Gaddafi came into power, he couldn't go back because he was opposed to this new regime. Mm. So they were both kind of exiles of sorts you know, in London. And I grew up there with my siblings. Um, and uh, I always had a connection with Cape Town mm. um, and South Africa through my mum, and we visited a lot. And so in 2005, I left London to come and make a film. I studied film. Uh, and I was uh, training as a director in London. But I, I, I left to make a film about Imam Abdullah Haroon, who is my mother's father. Mm. So 
yeah, I was kind of like trying to find out about my grandfather beyond uh, beyond the myths around him, and beyond the kind of just to find out who he was as a grandfather outside of him being this uh, martyr figure. Mm. And so I'm here. I'm still making films, and I completed that film six years after I arrived. Uh, yeah, and, and here I am. Thank you. So what exactly was your grandfather known for? So, yeah, Imam Haroon, if you come to Cape Town or if you talk to South African Muslims and you mention the Imam, right, he, he's known as the Imam because he, uh, he was born in 1923. Mm. And during, uh, during the mid-century, when apartheid was, you know, at its height, he was, uh, he became an imam. He was like the, one of the youngest, the youngest imam in Cape Town at the time. And he uh, was kind of quite outspoken and the, the Muslim community here at that time were quite conservative and they did it, they had, they had a higher status um, in the kind of racial categorization than the, than the blacks of the country, definitely and the Indians. Um, and so they didn't really want to rock the boat mm. with, the, with the white government in terms of wanting to pray where they wanted to pray and kind of go about their business. But they still were kind of trapped within the system. But Imam Harun uh, was opposed to this kind of way of thinking. And he would use his position as an imam initially uh, so he was made imam in 55 and so uh, i think he was 30 years old and um he used the, the member to uh, propagate ideas uh, anti-apartheid ideas he used the member to um to give the youth a voice and to give women a voice which in those times was kind of not the thing to do right yeah. because um it's quite patriarchal kind of space and but he was quite progressive in that way and as he as the 50s and 60s got worse in terms of the apartheid um, machine he became more outspoken and then he started to become um, active with uh, at, uh, opposition groups anti-apartheid groups like the PAC and African Congress some people of the ANC other groups Black Sash um, and he kind of, in a way, became more politically active. Uh, he would travel, he would use his position as an imam to travel in and out of the townships where you weren't allowed to go if you didn't have a pass, if you weren't black. And he would, he would propagate Islam, but also just kind of bring some kind of peace or speak about peace with the people there who were suffering the most. The people, the Muslim community... Um, his kind of peers back in, in the kind of colored areas of Cape Town didn't really agree with him uh, doing this work, going into the township, speaking to uh, the black population because they had their own kind of racist tendencies also. Yeah. Not all of them, but in the main, it was like this. People even called him, he was referred to as the Kafir Imam. Wow. Because he had friends in the townships and he helped to set up Kind of some of the first mosques in Cape Town in the townships, mm. and so he was also looked. Uh, um, he was also being, uh, what do you call it, being um, uh, spied on by the security police. Who and, and then in the late sixties, the mid to late sixties, he became more active, traveling and raising funds outside of the country for people who were who were impoverished in the country inside the country whose breadwinners were in prison or were killed, and he would bring money back and stuff like that. And so um, in 69, in May 69, so he took my mother to London in 68, December. He, he left her there to study. There was a kind of small South African community there. And then he went back to Cape Town. And in May of 69, he was imprisoned in... in uh, in the prison, local prison, by the security police, they came to the house and they imprisoned him under what they called the Terrorism Act mm. at the time, which was introduced in 67. Mm. Um, and this act 
stated that you could be imprisoned or detained without um, without any kind of lawyer up for up to four months yeah. um, or a hundred days or something like that. So no one spoke to him while he was in prison. May, June, July, August, in September, the end of September, he was uh, pronounced dead. Um, and you know, people thought he would come back. People thought he would come out. He wasn't a violent man. He didn't set up bombs or anything like that. But they tortured him. There was an autopsy and there was proof to there was uh, torturing uh, going on, and he had broken ribs. And he suffered, I think at the end, he suffered a heart attack. Mm. Um, so he was he died on the 27th, which was a Saturday. On the Monday was the Janaza. And then people were shocked. People, because he was quite loved in the community. He was very active. He was, he was very um, friendly with everyone. The people liked him. He was a very jovial figure. And um, on his funeral day, like, there were like 30,000 people in the streets following the, the janazah to the cemetery where he was buried. And, and on the night he was buried, there were earth tremors in Cape Town, um, which never happens, right? Uh, over here, there are no kind of fault lines here. And people, obviously the Muslim and the Christian and people of some spiritual belief attributed this to a sign from Allah. But this also became part of the myth around the Imam, right? Uh, the earthquake on the day he died. Since he died, he, he was killed in 69, and then he, his kind of legacy and his, the memory of the Imam and what he stood for and how he stood for it inspired the future generations of activists in, in the Western Cape mainly, and Muslims all around the country. So you have the 80s now where there are you know, big uprisings happening uh, lots of Muslims involved where they can add more of a voice than they did earlier and he's kind of uh, he inspired, he left a strong legacy in that way so now if you come to Cape Town and you ask Muslims about the Imam they're referring to him Imam Harun so yeah I mean there are many things there are many stories but he if you talk, if you, if you talk about the Islamic contribution to the anti-apartheid struggle from within or the, the, the non-contribution, the Islamic non-contribution to the anti-apartheid struggle, then Imam Harun's name comes up. Often Muslims here kind of claim him in a way to justify the fact that they did, you know, those days they didn't do anything. Uh, but, you know, it's, you know, push and pull. And we take him, we take out the martyrs uh, and we use them how we, how we do, you know. That's kind of generally his, his, the, the gist of his story. So you mentioned that um, Imam Abdullah Harun, when he was detained, that he was tortured. And I know the official story that the apartheid South African police gave was that he fell down uh, some stairs. And like mm -hmm. that contextualized with like just the history is that so many people, so many people who were struggling against apartheid from like Steve Biko, they were assassin they were essentially assassinated yes. by the security force as they were uh, detained. And then like the official story that they release was that somehow they just like an uh, Imam Abdullah Haroon's case that he just like fell down some stairs. Was that the official narrative? And uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. There were others, you know, there was Ahmed Timol in 72. Mm -hmm. in Johannesburg and they felt this and he he was thrown out of a window from a John Foster Square police station and they said he jumped you know? mm -hmm. um, Imam Harun yeah they said he fell down the stairs I went to the I went to the police station where he was pronounced dead and I saw the steps it's like three small steps there's no way this kind of thing could have killed anyone mm -hmm. they wow. even even in the court hearing afterwards, they offered my um, grandmother what they call it the ex gratia payment of five thousand rands, which is probably something like fifty pounds or so, it's hundred pounds or something like that. Uh, but this is like they offered her the payment as a, as a compassionate payment, but it, it was an admission, really, mm. right? 
So this was the normal narrative that the fell down the stairs, he slipped on a bar of soap, he jumped out the window. These are that was the, the that was the how they did it back then. Mm. Another element of Imam Abdullah Harun's life, I know you mentioned how at the time the Muslim community were largely had apathy towards really joining the anti-apartheid struggle. And Imam Abdullah Harun took a deviation from that apathy and began vocally speaking, you know, against apartheid as well as in his sermons, being a young Imam and attracting other youth and empowering women to give them a voice. What do you think particularly in Islam or, you know, in the Quran that inspired Imam Abdullah Harun to recognize apartheid as an unjust system and to encourage Muslims to struggle against it? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, you know, any anyone who has a cursory look at Islam can see that one of the main things that it's about is to stand up against injustice. And I think that's, you know, any Muslim will be fooling themselves if they thought otherwise. I think, mm. I mean, during that time, you can't really, on one hand, you can't really fault the community for not doing anything because it was a tough situation. I mean, I could not imagine how it would be to live under those circumstances where you can't move, you can't say what you want to say, especially after the Imam was killed, right? Because mm. you would think it's going to happen to me. But I think with, with, with my grandfather, he had uh, a series of teachers in his early youth who mm. kind of inspired in him those ideas of uh, working against injustice. Remember, this is like, he was, uh, he was a young student in the late 20s, early 30s. This was around the time when uh, people like Hassan al-Banna uh, were it was kind of the breakup of the Ottoman Empire had just happened. Uh, nationalism was kind of rife in, in the Islamic world, and uh, there were there were some ulama, some scholars who were trying to work against that. Uh, people like Hassan al Banna, people like Said Nursi, even from Turkey, and I think some of those ideas came through and influenced him in a way to say, look. The political is personal, you know. And I think those are the things he took with him, as well as just being honest with himself, you know, and saying, look, this isn't right. We need to say something at least. We're not going to do anything. We need to say something. And so, yeah, I think it was kind of always there, but just he had a series of teachers who highlighted it for him. Mm. And just with his yeah, own but... kind of fitra, fitra sense, you know. Yeah, I was reading some of the like judicial opinions from uh, Islamic jurists during apartheid South Africa, and I came across an opinion that was basically like it's it articulated that like so long as the apartheid government didn't prevent the construction of masajids or didn't prevent Muslims yeah. from praying or fasting, that Islam didn't necessitate struggle against the apartheid regime. And obviously, uh, Imam Abdullah Haroun, he wasn't of that opinion. Uh, and he did believe that Islam necessitated struggle against the apartheid regime. So you mentioned some of his um, te teachers or Islamic thinkers who he were influenced by. Can you elaborate upon that some more for me? Uh, yes, I, I mean, he went to he was sent to uh, Mecca to study his hifs and to study Quran. And just after, just before World War II broke out, he had to come back. So he didn't actually finish his Quranic studies. But um, I'll have to look up. While we're talking, I'll look for the name of his okay. teacher. Okay. But uh, I don't have it offhand right now. Okay. Um, it was around that time. It was around that time when Islam, Islamic uh, ideas in, uh, in the Middle East were becoming more political, right? Because before that, there was kind of some kind of ummah that was trying or in some way holding things together. Uh, but then it would became more of a political voice because of nationalism, because of the rise of, uh, you know, uh, 
maybe or maybe capitalism in some way, but more like the end of the colonial period, you know, when there was some kind of window that these African countries would get their countries back. There was also like ideas of now how do we how do we then deal use that and deal with that. So I think a lot of the political ideas came strong during that time. Yeah, I think this is, you know, like particularly relevant in terms of it's like a challenge to apolitical um, Muslims who seek to, you know, separate the political uh -huh. from the personal. Uh, one thing that I was reading about Imam Abdullah Haroun is that he was actually active in going to the Bantu stands and giving uh, da'wah. And so he earned the nickname, as you mentioned earlier, of Kafir Lover. For those who may not know, can you describe what exactly uh, Kafir meant in terms of apartheid South Africa and why Imam Abdullah earned that nickname? What, the and, word Kafir? You want me to yeah, yeah. explain what the word? Yeah. yeah, I mean, Kafir, even now, it's a, if you, there was a recent case of a woman calling someone Kafir I mean, publicly and she got like in prison. Mm. It's a, it's a, it's an, it's, an, it's an open act of racism, um, yeah. right? You, people don't don't even think about that. The, the word kafir uh, mention it to each other, yeah. so um, it's kind of like yeah, it's it's not a word you use. Yeah. Those days, I mean, the apartheid system was so strong and so kind of vociferous that it infiltrated everyone's minds and everyone's sphere of life. So that when you did see black people in the street. You automatically felt like you know you were above them or mm -hmm. they were definitely below you right so i think in those days yeah especially at white people to call uh to call black people kafirs was normal thing mm -hmm. and so for, for 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 the muslim people or in his community to to refer to him as that they're not only kind of putting down black people in the townships who are living in you know extreme conditions they're also putting down someone who's trying to help i guess you know many things that you can read into that it's like envy jealousy there's uh you know upsetness i mean it's basic nafs at work you know mm. uh, yeah so he there's an interesting story though he went to the township Langa, and he um, he was being followed by the police. So he went to see his friends there, some black Muslims there. He went with his friends from the town. And they had to escape. So one of the, the guys from the township said, put this uh, shoe shine on your face. Because he had a light skin and he had a bald head. So he kind of blackfaced himself up <laughs> to escape the, the police. <laughs> wow. So, wow. yeah, kind of funny that he used it, right? But I don't think he like took it to heart. He was just on his mission. You know, he kept going, even though people in the back were telling him all this uh, other nonsense. Are there any particular things that you think Muslims can learn from the life of Imam Abdullah Harun? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, <clears throat> you, one would need to read a little bit about him uh, to get a clearer idea of you know, you have to get an idea of the context of the space at the time, uh, what he was up against, what he, other things he did in his life, like he taught his daughter how to play piano, or he, he encouraged her to play piano at a time when kind of it's unheard of. He, he sent his daughter when she was 18, 1968, to London to study, which is, you know, it's also kind of unheard of. This is the daughter of an imam. He used to dress nicely. He would, you know, dress stylishly. He was even voted in one newspaper at the time as the best dressed man in Cape Town. So he was into like looking good. He was into vanity, I guess, in a way. There are lots and lots of pictures of him. He, he didn't mind people taking pictures of him. He would talk to women. He would talk to people he didn't know, non-Muslims, Muslims. So beyond the, the whole kind of political aspect of his life and him being an imam, there was also this other side where he was uh, an open person, right? But still very, you know, he would fast twice a week throughout his whole life, right? Monday, Thursday. So he was quite a strict 
uh, observant Muslim, and a spiritual man, he would go to the to the shrines of the sheikhs and make some dua or make some dhikr, uh, even while his friends waited in the car outside. Mm -hmm. So he would, and then he would go on his mission. He would go and try and help people. So if you read a little bit about him, understand the context of the space, maybe even if you see the film, how I kind of look at him in a way, then the lessons you learn are quite a few, quite a lot of lessons. But I think the main thing is just to be, or here is a man who was in a way true to himself and uh, true to teachings of Islam in a very open kind of progressive way. Um, and I think, yeah, we, I mean, look, if we get that from him in our lives, I think it's quite a lot. Where can people... Know, what, what, did, what did you get from it, from, from seeing the film or from reading about him? Yeah, so actually, um, a couple of years ago, like, I would say around three years ago, I took a course in my undergraduate uh, class, and I began just studying the history of apartheid South Africa just in just in general and just like the daily conditions that black people were dealt within apartheid south africa you know the bantu stands how black people needed a pass to go into white areas for work how black people could just be imprisoned and incarcerated just for not being employed and how you had like so many uh black people just in jail just because like they didn't have a job and so yeah clearly, you know, unjust, tyrannical system. And to hear that Muslims, that Muslims who, you know, are joined in the Quran to, you know, struggle against oppression and tyranny that, you know, there was like a largely, um, you know, a very, you know, apathetic uh, response to challenging ap apartheid via, you know, the opinion of the Muslim Judicial Council. And so when I came across the life of Imam Abdullah Haroon, you know, it, it really, really touched me because he was true to his conviction in terms of uh, challenging apartheid. He, as an Imam, he was able to connect with, you know, the youth and he made, he, he embodied Islamic principles of reaching out to the, you know, to the oppressed. He went to the uh, Bantu stands in order to deliver uh, Dawah. He didn't just stay in his area, but he reached out to you know the bantu stands which were the most black people in the bantu stands were living under extreme conditions of poverty of of displacement and then his call for other muslims and inspiring other muslims uh to challenge um apartheid was 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 something i found very very honorable and courageous I definitely think that more Muslims need to learn about the life of Imam Abdullah Haroon because very few, at least in the United States, have like known about his um, life and his, like his commitment to struggle. So inshallah, I do want to seek to uh, work to educate more Muslims about his life as well as the lessons we can learn from his life in terms of challenging injustices here in the United States. I think even in post-apartheid South Africa, uh, there's still so much the legacy of apartheid lives on in terms of land distribution in terms of economic uh distribution of wealth uh still the wealth is largely in white control the land largely under white control and i think muslims need to come back to you know the legacy of imam abdullah Harun in terms of challenging contemporary you know the legacy of apartheid and the unjust injustices that apartheid still the legacy that it still has to this very day. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. I mean, it's it's interesting you say that American Muslims should know about him because yeah, I think when I started making the film, I came to the US mm. two thousand and six or five <laughs> to I came to ISNA, the ISNA conference, mm. right? And I wanted to, I, I cut a promo together. I wanted to raise money, basically. I thought, who better to go to, that, quite naively, <clears throat> than the Muslims, right, to raise money. Most people didn't know, never heard about Imam Arun. They were surprised that I, I was even from, you know, South Africa, and they thought, what? I, I thought there were only black and white people there. 
Mm. And um, so there, there was generally, maybe still is, a lot of ignorance about Islam and its role in the country. And also the idea that, you know, revolutionary figures are not just black. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They're not just African American. Yeah. You know, not just Malcolm X, it's not just Martin yeah. Luther King, it's not just these kind of people. Yeah. But they come in all forms and kind mm -hmm. of blackness in this, the eco sense of blackness mm -hmm. is is bigger than that. Mm -hmm. And here we have like a modern Muslim revolutionary figure mm -hmm. who kind of encompasses the old those those traditional teachings and kind of a modern approach. And if you think about I mean what struck me the most about his story was that um, if you if you try and think about the the, the, uh, the Muslim kind of revolutionary characters from our you know last fifty years, people that you and I can relate to on a level, there aren't many, right? They, you know Malcolm X, of course, um, but then people always refer back to the Prophet وسلم, and his companions. Yeah. Which of course is all good, but it was a long time ago. I mean, I find it always, I've always found it hard to relate to that time and place because it's kind of quite far gone. But when I talk, when I hear about Imam Harun, then I'm like, yeah, I understand now, you know? Yeah. I think it, in that way, it's also important for us to uncover, discover, embrace our modern day kind of Islamic heroes, I guess, revolutionary heroes. Yeah, definitely. And I also think so within the United States, there is this sort of um, disconnect between black Muslims who like their Islam is rooted in the history of like a challenge to white supremacy, uh, beginning with the Nation of Islam, beginning with its uh, branch into like Malcolm X and Malcolm X has left a, a revolutionary legacy and many Muslims adhere to many black people come to Islam particularly because they seek to be spiritually empowered, challenging white supremacy. And there's a disconnect between many immigrant Muslims who come to the United States for economic reasons or for, you know, for their own financial motivations and who don't root themselves in that same struggle against white supremacy. And I think Imam Abdullah Haroon, as like a revolutionary Muslim figure, you know, he's not black. Yet he aligned himself with the black struggle. I think mm -hmm. looking at his legacy as well as studying his life can begin to like motivate, you know, more Muslims to like solve that disconnect as well as 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 well as for the unity of Muslims. Um, as you said, you know, not all revolutionary figures are black. Like I, I never, mm -hmm. I don't recall a time in my life where like I never knew I, I ever. I ever did not know who Malcolm X was. Like always, like as a little kid, I always knew who Malcolm X was, and I always knew like what Malcolm X taught. But like Imam Abdullah Haroon, you know, I didn't know who who he was until uh, my college years, my undergraduate years. So me, me, and me, you know, I grew up in Malcolm X. Mm. And, and I, I, Malcolm X was always there, was yeah. uh, in front of me. Yeah. And when I was making the film, even I was like. How can I make a connection here, right? Malcolm was in the 60s. Imam was killed in 69. It was the yes. summer of love and, you know, in the US, first man you know, on the moon and all that stuff. How can I connect these guys? Mm. The, which is also my own kind of brainwashing of what a revolutionary figure is. And then, but going through the story and kind of learning more, I realized the connection is there in Islam, right? There, but you, there's no need to make that connection in the, in the story of the imam's life. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I was, all, I was, I was also like, yeah, Malcolm is the guy, but actually there are others. <laughs> too. Yeah. yeah. And just like Malcolm X, you know, Imam Abdullah Haroon, he was martyred. He was martyred for his beliefs and his conviction mm -hmm. in Islam that I believe drove him to challenge apartheid in the same way that Islam inspired Malcolm X to challenge, you know, the oppression and racism against black people in the United States. And I think we should look at white supremacy as something that is global. 
Um, so in the same way that apartheid South Africa was a European settler colony that implemented apartheid laws to discriminate against uh, black South Africans. And then on the other side of the hemisphere, you have Malcolm X challenging Jim Crow laws in the United mm -hmm. States. Mm -hmm. uh, the way in which white supremacy as a political system seeks to elevate white white people, European descendant people, is something that Muslims have to be vocal in challenging. And I think Imam Abdullah Haroon, his conviction in Islam challenged him to challenge the white supremacy in his area. And I think other Muslims can uh, begin to learn from that as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, white supremacy, if you want to talk about it, like apartheid is the height of that, you know? Yeah. And it happens all, and it happened in India when the English were there, you know. Yeah. Um, so when you say, when you have these ideas of Black Lives Matter, then, you know, they don't just matter in the US, right? Yeah. So it's far reaching, it's, it is a global thing. Absolutely. I think Imam, in a way, I think Imam, you, you saw that. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, if individuals would like to read more into Imam Abdullah Haroon's life or learn more about him, what, where can they turn to? Um, well, there is a book called The Killing of the Imam, which was written by Bani Desai. And uh, he was a very good friend of the Imam. He was EAC member, um, very famous <laughs> and a struggle guy, um, who after the Imam's death decided to write this book. Um, there is a website that we run as a family here called this imamharun.com. Okay. You can read up about his whole life there. You can see pictures. There are links to other interesting things. Um, there's a, I made a film about a documentary film about him, his life and legacy, uh, which has kind of become, you know, a document on his life in a visual way. Uh, and any South African Muslim you come across, ask them. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to come back to one point you discussed earlier. You said that when you when you came to the United States, and then you said you were at a, in a conference that you know the mm -hmm. people were like largely uh, not cognizant of the life of Imam Abdullah Haroon. And you know, people in the United States they know about Black Muslim revolutionaries, just you know Malcolm X. But the way that Malcolm X is talked about is often he's often like stripped. He's like almost like tokenized in the sense that they like talk about his life in a way that's detached from the Black freedom struggle, really just upheld as like this token, but like mm. without like a real commitment to the struggle that. Um, he embodied, and so I definitely think that, um, just like in studying the life of Imam Abdullah Haroon, who in my eyes is like a hero, you know, on the par with Malcolm X and just about any other revolutionary, he was martyred, you know, by the apartheid regime and for his conviction in Islam. So I definitely, inshallah, look forward to just more Muslims learning about his life and learning from his struggle as well as, you know, continuing the struggle against contemporary manifestations of racism and oppression. Yeah. In the world. I mean, these, these figures, you know, I mean, I, I personally don't think it's for all of us to, to be like them, or to yeah. be them. Yeah. <clears throat> they, these specific figures come out in different times mm -hmm. to show us, right? Yeah. And to teach us and to remind us and to lead us. If we were all like that, there wouldn't be a problem. Mm. But we kind of need these people without us feeling like we have to be like them. So, and because it, it's not easy, it's not easy yeah. to to stand up against, you know, Trumpism or apartheid or whatever it is, you know, yeah. as a community or as an individual. So the battle is always is always a personal battle of the nafs and the lower self. You know, those basic teachings of Islam. Mm. It always comes back to that. So. That every now and then there are these specific individuals who Allah gives them light, gives them hidayah, gives them kind of strength, like Malcolm, mm -hmm. like Imam. And then, so it's important to see them as beacons. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
of course we strive to emulate but it's okay if we don't get there you know mm. at least we need to recognize who's on who's on the team you know mm. yeah. well you know thank you for sharing your words you know on sharing about the life of your uh, grandfather and inshallah we can do more to you know spread information about his life especially here in the united states where the knowledge is very minimal is there any other things uh, you want to share about your grandfather well i mean if you if you ever want to screen the film mm -hmm. you have the link and you have the password you can screen okay. it to whoever you want you're welcome appreciate um, it I think there's something to be said about how the Imam saw himself mm. as kind of, you know, these, you hear these stories of how the Prophet ﷺ was always clean and um, well turned out. Mm -hmm. And he would approach people who were his enemies or his friends in a very kind of positive and clean manner. Yeah. And I think Imam also had that in his way. So the appearance, which comes down to the smile, you know, which is a sunnah, to, if you look at all those photos of him, he's always smiling, he's always looking like on point. Yeah. I think that's something good to take, you know, in this day and age where it's kind of very materialist, it's very kind of focused to the self, it's very much on the appearance and how we turn out. Yeah. Um, then it's good if we turn out with the right intention. Your appearance kind of speaks before you you speak, right? Yeah. Uh, there's something in that thing you can all gain. Because I don't know, I don't know many people. I'm definitely not beyond my ego, you know. Yeah. So, if, if yeah, kind of take that. All right. Well, uh, thank you for joining me for this discussion. Inshallah, the Muslims can learn from Imam Abdullah Harun's life and we can help to uh, work continue his legacy. Okay, shukran. So in closing, as I began to read the story of Imam Harun, what saddened me the most was not the brutal actions that the apartheid regime took against him, but the fact that Harun was ostracized by his own Muslim community after Imam Harun's assassination, the historian Ursulo Gather writes that Harun, Imam Harun became virtually forgotten by Muslims. Indeed, many were so concerned by white perception that many of the scholars of the Muslim Judicial Council saw Imam Harun as an embarrassment. In light of this, I elected to write a letter to Imam Harun to tell him what I wish I could tell him. Had he been alive. The letter reads, Assalamu alaikum, my beloved brother in Islam. Though Muslims in masses, including those considered scholars of this deen, shun and condemn you, you are my Imam. You are my Imam because you heeded the call of Allah to be persistently standing firm for justice and you died bearing witness to the truth of Islam. You are my Imam because you understood that Islam is not a religion for cowards nor for those who capitulate to oppressors. I am sincerely sorry that your own Muslim community at times shunned and forgot you, but you, your reward is with Allah, and I pray that Allah grants you the highest levels of Jannah. You gave up your life to see that apartheid fail. I am Ummah, this Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is desperately in need of revolutionary Imams who recognize that our, like you did, that our prophet, peace be upon him, was a revolutionary, and we have a duty to struggle against oppression and tyranny wherever it is found. من الرجال والنساء والولدان الذين يقولون ربنا أخرجنا من هذه القرية من هذه القرية الظالم أهلها واجعل لنا من لدنك وليا 
من لدنك وليا وجعل لنا من لدنك نصيرا It is a matter with you that you fight not in the cause of Allah and for the oppressed among men, women, and children whose cry is, Our Lord, take us out of this city of oppressive people and appoint for us yourself a protector and appoint for us from yourself a helper.